Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu and by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Hundreds of thousands of Hoosiers have gotten the COVID-19 vaccination with many more waiting their turn. Ahead, the latest on who can sign up now and the state's timeline for opening up eligibility to more groups. Just about a week after the city removed a homeless camp from a Bloomington park, volunteers mobilized to open a new shelter and get people out of the cold. We realized that there just weren't enough shelter beds for people this winter and so we felt a strong need to kind of uh, find a way to resolve that problem and challenge and step in and kind of help. The Libertarians had a strong showing in Indiana in November. Coming up, how the party is working to capitalize on that momentum. This is our moment. This is the time when we can really make an impact on the political landscape in Indiana. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. The Trump administration's failure to produce a national stockpile of the COVID-19 vaccine is preventing Indiana from moving its vaccine distribution plan forward. Hoosier 70 and older currently are allowed to schedule appointments to get the vaccine. The next tier was supposed to be 60 and older. Now it will be those at least 65. That's because the state's allotment of vaccines has not increased beyond the roughly 80,000 doses a week it's already getting. Indiana Department of Health Chief Medical Officer Dr. Lindsay Weaver says the state is maintaining its age-based distribution plan in favor of one that prioritizes frontline workers like teachers or grocery store clerks. At this time, we must continue to concentrate on vaccinating those people who are at the highest risk of hospitalizations and death. Even people with very minimal risk of exposure are still have a much higher risk of hospitalization and death compared to younger people who have a very high risk of exposure. Now to schedule an appointment for the vaccine, go to ourshot.in.gov or call 211. When state health officials announced last week a variation of COVID-19 had been found in Indiana, it was not what a pandemic weary public needed to hear. But as Pat Bean reports, it's not necessarily bad news. The news of the new strain of the virus was not unexpected. Viruses always mutate. This mutation was first identified in Great Britain last fall. The good news is that it has shown to be no more lethal than the original strain, which has now caused 2 million deaths worldwide but it is more contagious, at least 50% so. And that means it could be time to double down on preventative measures, wearing masks, washing hands, and social distancing. I think it's time to consider using um, more protective masks. You know, we know surgical masks, isolation masks, N95s and things like that are more protective. Um, maybe those are more important than they were before. The concern with anything more contagious is that means more cases, and more cases means more deaths. The United States surpassed 400,000 COVID-19 fatalities this week. Anytime that you have anything that's more transmissible, it's going to increase the reproductive rate of that, that disease uh, and make it harder to control. And so, you know, I think it's a concern when we have just this much sheer spread already. It's not the only mutation out there, and it won't be the last. McKean says two variations were found in Ohio and another in California. There's one in South Africa that seems to be concerning and has a mutation that they call a, an escape mutation. They think that would allow it to evade either an antibody um, medication or, or maybe a vaccine. But the good thing is overall, um, these vaccines do appear to be safe or effective uh, against this, these variants. McKean is hopeful the new administration in Washington can ramp up distribution and provide more resources to the states to help with a backlog of getting shots into arms. 
And with the vaccine now in circulation to combat COVID-19, he thinks the pandemic may have reached its apex. Cases have decreased in the last week in 35 states. Uh, deaths have decreased in 18 states in the last week. There are some rays of sunshine here. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Pat Bean. Indiana has crossed another COVID-19 milestone, even as numbers trend downward. The Indiana Department of Health reported the state eclipsed the 600,000 case mark this week, but the seven-day positivity rate is down to 10.8 percent, the lowest rate in more than two months. Hospitalizations are also at their lowest number since early November, and the moving daily death rate is down to 43. Since the pandemic began, more than 9,200 Hoosiers have died from the virus. Governor Eric Holcomb wants to create a regional development initiative that he says will help the state's economy recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Brandon Smith reports. Governor Eric Holcomb began his 2021 State of the State address Tuesday with a somber reflection on the toll COVID-19 has had on Indiana. It's impossible to calculate the far-reaching ripple effect of the personal and community loss of lives and livelihoods. After that, the usual talking points. His recently announced budget proposal, which includes hundreds of millions to spend down state debt and a $377 million K-12 school funding increase, improvements in job creation and training, infrastructure investments, the state's COVID-19 vaccine distribution plan, and more. Then a new announcement, a regional development program through the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. The IEDC will work with regions that collaborate to develop strategies designed to improve quality of place, advance industry sector development, and grow workforce development initiatives among regions and educators and employers and our state's workforce. Indiana Democratic legislative leaders say Holcomb's state of the state fell short in addressing the needs of working class Hoosiers. Missing, said House Minority Leader Phil Giaquinta, were any guarantees to increase teacher pay. Uh, this is a third state of the state in a row that I've heard uh, the governor make promises to Hoosier educators that an increase in pay is on the way. Um, I know Hoosier educators are tired of empty promises. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Brandon Smith. Former Vice President Mike Pence is moving back to Indiana this summer, but he's not saying what's next for his career. Pence and his wife Karen arrived back in Columbus on Wednesday following Joe Biden's inauguration. A small group of supporters greeted them at the airport. Pence spoke to the crowd thanking God, his family, the Indiana Republican Party, and former President Donald Trump for the opportunity to serve as Vice President. Serving as your Vice President was the greatest honor of our life. But now that that season of service has come to an end, we just had to come home. Pence touted Trump for the steps he took to strengthen the nation's military and economy while also appointing conservative judges. Well, during the last two weeks, the issue of homelessness has taken center stage in Bloomington. The mayor directed city workers to remove a homeless encampment from Seminary Park despite objections from local elected officials and organizations. That left dozens of people who'd been sleeping in the park with no place to go. But the community rallied. And as Ethan Burks reports, a new shelter opened this week. Two weeks ago, the city put up signs in Seminary Park warning those who were camping overnight that they would have to seek shelter elsewhere because it is against the law to sleep there. It was at that point that Forrest Gilmore of Beacon Inc. knew something had to be done and fast. We realized that there just weren't enough shelter beds for people this winter and so we felt a strong need to kind of uh, find a way to resolve that problem and challenge and step in and kind of help the situation. Gilmore and other housing advocates asked for a moratorium on the removal, but on January 14th, the city sent police officers into the park to enforce the 11 p.m. curfew. Gilmore moved quickly to find a location for a temporary shelter to get it inspected and ready to welcome in people. The location he found was a 4,000 square foot warehouse along the Beeline Trail near Switchyard Park with a capacity of 49 beds. This is intended to be a short-term emergency winter shelter. We're just trying to get through the winter season. Um, so uh, right now we have a target date of, of keeping it open until April 15th. It's a low barrier shelter, so anybody can come in under any condition. Gilmore says it does not matter if people are intoxicated, as long as they don't have any illegal substances in their possession. He also says it's the only local shelter that allows couples to stay together. We heard that that was a barrier for people, 
um, in terms of wanting to sleep inside or sleep in a shelter, so we tried to eliminate that barrier. The shelter offers people a place to sleep at night and food, but it doesn't solve the overall issue of homelessness in the long term. Tensions were on display earlier in the week when people marched to the streets of Bloomington on Martin Luther King Day. The rally began in Seminary Park and then moved to Mayor John Hamilton's house where folks stood outside and shouted through a megaphone. They don't want us to live, they want us to exist. And they want us to exist how they say we should exist. Hamilton says it's one of his goals to provide more affordable housing and get people who are experiencing homelessness off the streets. We don't want people living outside, but some people do. Now you don't get to just choose wherever you want to live outside in this city. We, we do not allow encampments in the downtown public park. You can't do it in, in the middle of a sidewalk. So we're, we're trying to make sure people get into safe spaces outside of the elements, which can be fatal. The mayor says the city has invested millions of dollars towards affordable housing during his tenure. At this week's city council meeting, Hamilton criticized the council for not approving his tax increase that he says would have allocated more money for his housing initiatives. I urged that we enact new revenue last fall. You weren't ready to take that step then. I believe the need continues and indeed may be growing. The tax increase would have earmarked $250,000 for services to people experiencing homelessness starting the year 2022 through at least the year 2026. But as for solving the issue of homelessness altogether, Hamilton says he doesn't know what that price figure would look like. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ethan Burks. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Libertarians in Indiana are energized after a positive showing in last fall's election. Ahead, what's next for the state's third party? We look back at the life of Angel, a Burmese mountain therapy dog who touched thousands of lives in Monroe County. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Stay close to Indiana News Desk as we trace education issues all the way from the Capitol to your child's classroom. So many topics that arise each year in the State House affect what happens every day in the schoolhouse. The WTIU News Team is committed to helping you stay up to date with the issues that affect your family's future. Keep yourself informed. Tune in to Indiana News Desk, your source for regional and state in-depth news. Welcome to Amanpour on PBS. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London, giving you the global view. I've covered the world for nearly three decades and I'm dedicated to bringing you all the facts. Please join me for conversations with newsmakers, world leaders. Good to be with you, Christiane. Artists and writers. The people who define, change and challenge our world. That's Amanpour on PBS. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Political conversations in 2020 were unsurprisingly dominated by the presidential race. But the Libertarian Party quietly had one of its best years ever, and much of that support occurred right here in Indiana. Mitch Legan reports on the party's work to keep the momentum rolling in the 2020s. Evan McMahon's been working toward this moment for a decade. I mean, we're talking at least 20 or 30 campaigns that I've, I've been directly involved in on the senior level, either as a campaign manager or, uh, you know, to that caliber. McMahon started volunteering with Indiana Libertarians in 2010. Now he's one of the party's top campaign experts and helped oversee the best statewide finish for a Libertarian in the state's history. My name's Donald Rainwater and I'm running for governor of the state of Indiana. I'm running because I believe that you know best how to make the decisions for you and your family. Rainwater's message of personal responsibility and individual liberties resonated in the solidly conservative state, and he secured the country's second best finish ever for a libertarian candidate for governor with 11% of the vote. I don't know if you believe we're going to win this thing, but I believe we're going to win this thing. The party's platform of limited government power caught on with Hoosiers, who thought the governor was overstepping his authority with his coronavirus emergency mandates. Tomorrow I will sign an executive order that will mandate that Hoosiers wear face coverings during specific times and in specific places. We live in a constitutional republic where we should tell government what we want, not the other way around. Donald Rainwater didn't win the gubernatorial race, but gosh, if he did not have an incredible turnout that was 
for a loss, essentially a victory for the Libertarian Party. They have to be able to leverage that and keep that message going with voters. That's McMahon's focus now, capitalizing on that groundswell of support. But will that be possible years from now when the pandemic is hopefully a distant memory? My first reaction was this is just in response to the mask mandates. The anger that they feel towards the establishment who have continued to violate the things that they said they believed in isn't going to go away. So he's spending 14 hours a day making calls, pouring through election data, and organizing party affiliates in counties that were previously lacking. And it seems to be paying off. There was so much interest in organizing that the party virtually held its first ever affiliation day back in December. We've just appointed you to organize your first meeting, get people involved. And at the meeting, they'll accept or adopt your local bylaws. 25 of the state's 92 counties had active libertarian parties. And with McMahon's work, things are trending toward having affiliates in half of counties by February. In his perfect world, there will be active parties in every county by the end of the year. If you're toiling in the wilderness in a, in a minor party uh, and you see this kind of progress, it's very, very promising. Party leadership feels a strong showing in the 2022 Secretary of State election will put them in the position to make a real run at the legislature or a statewide office by the end of the decade. But experts like Diane say the party could have more success influencing future policy. Maybe to get the other parties or the other candidates to shift or uh, move their platforms in some ways. Uh, and typically that's what happens. If there's a third party that's really promising and they're running on a set of issues that are all of a sudden very appealing to the public. And that could happen sooner than one might think. The General Assembly is already discussing bills to limit the governor's emergency powers. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. 2020 tied for the hottest year on record globally. Though it wasn't the hottest year for Indiana, it marked the sixth year in a row that temperatures were above normal. As Indiana Public Broadcasting's Rebecca Thiel reports, we're already seeing the damaging effects of that warming. As temperatures rise in Indiana, we're seeing more heavy rain events, some of which caused flooding in parts of the state last year. Sean Sublett is a meteorologist with the nonprofit Climate Central. He says the U.S. has gotten better at preventing deaths from severe weather. But there's still a lot of damage to, to property and livelihoods, and it could tear apart families. These are the kinds of things that we need to think about going forward, because carbon dioxide isn't just going to come out of the atmosphere by itself. Sublet says the fact that the Earth continues to hit these new heat records shows the need to address climate change fast. Among other things, Indiana is also expected to have more heat-related deaths, crop losses, and illnesses from ticks and mosquitoes due to climate change. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Rebecca Thiel. The Brown County Music Center is hemorrhaging money in the wake of COVID-19. The county extended the center a lifeline this week, but as Brock Turner reports, there's debate about whether it will be enough to keep the new venue afloat. The Brown County Music Center opened in late 2019 had already hosted several events and was already turning a profit. But the coronavirus halted shows at the 2000 seat venue in March. Since then, it's been used as a COVID-19 testing site and for various departmental trainings and court hearings. The center's executive director, Christian Webb, says it cost about $10,000 a day to operate the facility. Again, we didn't know. And at the time we signed this, everyone was running and ducking for cover. People weren't allowed outside their house or, you know, the stay at home order. We didn't know what was going on and what the venue ultimately was going to be used for. The Brown County Council voted this week to transfer $239,000 or about half of its federal CARES Act money to the center. Webb says the money is for services conducted in 2020 and should keep the center afloat for the first half of 2021. During the meeting, Webb claimed the county is getting a deal because the center is providing so many COVID related services. But during the planning and construction of the venue, public officials made multiple promises that taxpayer money would not be used to support the music center. And some residents who spoke out at the meeting say they're worried the allocation will limit the county's ability to respond to other unexpected expenses related to the coronavirus. I don't know how we can spend 50% of our CARES fund when we don't even know what our needs are going to be if we haven't even looked at them. County leaders for their part say the move is both legal and necessary because other avenues to assist the center, like using the innkeeper's tax, don't cover the center's expenses. 
you know, if you recall at the beginning of 2020, the guidance that we were hearing from up above in Indianapolis was that revenues were going to fall dramatically, 80, 90 percent. Last April, the county issued a temporary loan to the center, which helped cover loan interest payments. The center still isn't paying anything on the principal to the loan the bank has issued. Most events have been rescheduled, but health experts say it will likely be fall at the earliest before attending events like concerts is safe. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. The inauguration of President Joe Biden this week officially brought an end to the 2020 election saga. Former President Donald Trump's wave of lawsuits over results put the Electoral College in the spotlight once again. But there'd be no Electoral College if one Indiana senator had his way. Here's Mitch Leakin with another History Through Headlines segment. It was November 7th, 1968. The first season of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was over. The Beatles' Hey Jude was at the top of the charts, and Republican Richard Nixon was elected president in a hotly contested three-way race that included Democrat Hubert Humphrey and segregationist Alabama Governor George Wallace. The headline reads, Close contest points to need for election reform. After losing the 1964 Democratic primary, Wallace launched a third-party campaign for president in 68 and won five states in the Deep South. People were very concerned that basically, you know, if he had done a little better or if Nixon had done a little worse, that you would have had an election thrown into the House of Representatives. And then, you know, Wallace would have more or less been able to extract all sorts of concessions. So Indiana Senator Birch Bayh, who was chair of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments, began rallying support for a project he'd been working on, an amendment that would call for the direct election of the president, eliminating the Electoral College. If you are not in one of those 18 or 20 states that are in play on Election Day, it really doesn't make much difference whether you get out to vote or not, and I think that's terrible. A 1968 Gallup poll showed 80 percent of Americans liked Bayh's proposal, and it passed the House in 1969. But Southern Democrats filibustered the bill. And Wallace was not able to run again in the way that they were worried about. So then people lost interest in electoral college reform, you know, um, until 2000. Bai would continue pushing to eliminate the electoral college for the rest of his time in the Senate and after. But 1969 is the closest he'd get. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. And Angel, the Burmese mountain dog, touched thousands of lives in Monroe County as a volunteer therapy dog before she passed away in the fall. In 2015, Angel was at the Bloomington Farmers Market with her dad, Stephen Coopersmith, when they met Rebecca Warren, executive director of the Monroe County Humane Association. Karen Coopersmith, Angel's mom, remembers hearing all about it. Rebecca thought Angel was just adorable and Angel was just cozying up to her. And she said, do you know anything about the therapy program? The MCHA Therapy Animal Program aims to improve mental, physical, emotional, and cognitive health throughout the community through interaction with animals. By February 2016, Angel and Karen Coopersmith had gone through training to be a therapy team for the program. Angel was already a pretty much obedient dog, but she learned some new skills for the all new environments she would be in. If we were going into, say, a nursing home and uh, a pill were dropped on the floor, you don't want the dog to pick up the pill, so they have to learn, leave it. During her four years in the program, Angel visited kids at public schools, IU students at Wells Library during finals week, residents in nursing homes, and struggling readers at the public library. But Angel also worked in more serious settings. She spent time with dementia patients and visited Susie's Place, a child advocacy center where she would sit and play with children before they went into forensic interviews. She had an innate uh, feeling for going to the people who needed her. And uh, that was very, very special. I also had some therapists say that uh, she would look into your soul. Once when Angel was visiting College Mall to cheer up shoppers, a security guard ushered Angel and Karen over to a woman who had gone into shock. Angel was able to help bring the woman out of shock before anyone called an ambulance. 
Karen says she became Angel's mom instead of just Karen, and when Angel died from bacterial pneumonia in September, she received emails, texts, cards, and flowers from countless people who adored Angel. One woman who had only met Angel a couple of times with her children wrote Karen this note. We loved Angel. We'd seen her in the mall a couple of times. Anyone that ever met Angel would remember her. She was such a calm and sweet dog. She loved being pet and loved her treats. I can say without a doubt in my mind, she was truly an angel. The Cooper Smiths recently adopted Barley, a 15-month-old Bernice mountain dog who needed to be rehomed. I know, I know. Karen says he's too young and rambunctious to be a therapy dog yet, but it might be in his future. He loves people, after all, just like Angel. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great night. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members, thank you.